of Video Game Crosstalk, the monthly podcast of gamers talking tech, science, and whatever else comes to mind. I'm your host, Anthony Rossi, and with me this episode is you, the attendees of Empire State Comic Con 2019. Thank you so much. Woo! All right, so let's get this party started. So, what I plan on doing in this presentation is going through a brief history of the technological developments that allowed video games to create a more immersive experience for the players. And we are moved by these experiences, we are inspired to create additional art. So the agenda for this presentation, we'll start off a little bit about me and how I got into podcasting. Then we'll move on into how gaming has grown up over the years, how it's developed and how it's matured into its most recent art forms. From there, we'll go on to how these developments actually work into creating an immersive experience for the player. And from that, we'll discuss a few guests that I've had on my podcast, a few other community members, and the art that they've been creating over the years. And once we have all this information, what do we do with it? How can we bring this into the classroom and leverage the enthusiasm that people already have for these concepts? And then following, we'll do a general Q&A. So me personally, I started gaming on my family's Commodore 64. Way back when you had to type something like load A colon, open quotation, menu, and quotation, comma eight, comma one. So yeah, I see some nodding going on. Awesome. Welcome to the family. And technology has developed so much since then. Despite my best efforts, I did eventually grow up, went to school for engineering, and I worked as a mechanical drafter for the majority of my professional career, mostly in refrigeration design for commercial systems. I currently work as a technical editor, which basically means I edit engineer's grammar full-time. And yes, that is a full-time job. <laughs> In about 2010, content creation was really coming to a head. It was really gaining steam. And I decided, let's take a shot at blogging. So, like everyone else on the internet, started on my free site, started blogging. Unfortunately, I am very verbose, and my blog posts tended to be upwards of 2,500 words. And nobody had time for that kind of reading. Way too long. So, after blogging for a few sites, I decided, let's change direction a little bit. And that's when I came up with the idea for Video Game Crosstalk. I figured since all my friends that I've made that work in the industry, either in the science or technology fields, are all gamers and geeks as well, rather than doing just a tech blog or just a gaming and geekery podcast, let's combine the two. And what I've been doing for the past couple of years is having a different guest every episode. And we talk about how they contribute to the industry. I've had people that range from a fire warden to the Pine Bush Preserve uh, locally, I've had a VP of information technology uh, not too long ago. And I've also had some Twitch streamers and cosplayers come on. So a whole range of individuals. So like I said, I've been gaming for, and this depressed me, over 30 years as I was doing the math to figure out when I started gaming. Again, at that time it was on a Commodore 64. I've grown up through the analog to digital conversion. And let's be honest, gaming, for the most part, especially at younger ages, is escapist. We want to leave whatever world we are currently in and move into someplace else, someplace more exciting, or just get away from it all for a few hours. But as time went on, and technology developed, they went from just being pixels into something a little bit more. As the technology developed, it allowed us to do more, and more of just everything, from visual graphics to the audio to the in-game mechanics. At some point, they progressed all the way to the point where battle mechanics began to matter in certain role-playing games. Party balance began to matter. Item balance began to matter. You could interact with NPCs and other characters in the game, and all of these decisions began to matter. They didn't just mature in content as far as violence and gore or anything else that people like to associate with games, but in creating emotional relationships and connections to the characters. Final Fantasy III 
And yes, I'm calling it Final Fantasy III because I'm old, and it said Final Fantasy III on the cartridge when I played it. <laughs> was one of those first games where I really began to notice that character balance and party balance really began to matter. You would have different characters who would specialize in different skill sets or different purposes within your adventure. At this time, it was also truly pushing the limits of the Super Nintendo uh, back in 1994. Assassin's Creed, definitely one of the big impact points in my life where I realized that playing this game, this is as close as witnessing and experiencing ancient cities as they existed back in that day. The visuals, of course, were beautiful, especially for the time, which is absolutely astounding. But Ubisoft never shies away from political strife, from strife between state and church and conspiracy theories. But it was that beauty of walking around Damascus or Acre that really struck me and began to really hit home for how much this technology has developed for our experiences. I've had the pleasure of seeing video games live twice in my life, and I suggest everyone to go see that. It's an absolutely amazing experience. It was founded by Tommy Tellerico. We'll talk about him a little bit more later. And what he has done is created a touring concert experience where he rearranges retro and modern video game theme music for a full symphonic orchestra. I've seen them locally at Schenectady, at Proctor's Theater with the Schenectady Symphony Orchestra, and as well as Pittsfield, Massachusetts with their symphonic orchestra. And as they're playing, they will actually show gameplay footage on the big screen while the concert is going on. So like I said, it's not just prettier graphics. As the technology evolved, so did the developer's ability to include more things within the games. You now have the additional horsepower that can handle ambient noise, be it just crickets in the background or a river babbling behind you. Ambient conversations happening on a city street as you walk around. Ambient conversations between your party members as you happen to be just shopping for goods in whatever city you happen to be in. It also makes you an active participant as far as gaming as opposed to watching a television show or watching a movie. There are some games where it's just simply you're in an office, per se, and one of the characters in the game is saying, hey, can you go hand me the Johnson folder? So you walk over, you curse your avatar over to the desk, you hit a button, pick up the folder, you turn around, you bring it back over to him, and since you're a gamer, you're a jerk, so you actually walk around the sofa first, and then kind of like turn it so you smack the guy in the back of the head because as gamers, that's the kind of, yeah, I, I know you do that. I know you do that. <laughs> because that's what you do. But just that little bit makes you an active participant in the entertainment. You're no longer just sitting on your couch or sitting in the theater and seeing, oh, can you hand me the Johnson file? And the actor goes over, grabs it, and then immediately comes back. You get to control that little bit. And to talk about this a little bit more, the next few screens are actually captured from my PlayStation 4. So the first one is Hellblade, Send You a Sacrifice. And for those of you who have played this game, you know that this picture is actually kind of a uh, false advertising bit. It is a very dark game, but it plays with your emotions so, so well. And in this picture, the one that I chose to show, is such peace and joy. And you're able to create that with higher resolutions and higher <clears throat> caliber talent for this. So the facial recognition or the facial motion capture allowed this. One of the big things of Hellblade was that how they worked the audio. If you play the game, I highly suggest you wait until after you complete it to watch the special features because there are a few spoilers in there. But the developers worked with mental health professionals in order to create some of the visual effects, as well as the audio. There is a scene in the, the making of, we'll call it, where they had the audio mic set up in the middle of a room, and they actually constructed prosthetic ears to put on the mic, and they had the voice actors and actresses walk around that ear set up, delivering their lines. And not only that, to work in the psychosis that Senua experiences, 
they have them speak as they walk around at different pitches, saying different things simultaneously. So they have one voice saying, where is she going? Why is she going that way? You'll have other voices saying, she has to turn back. She'll never make it. You can do it. Where is she going? And that all happens at the same time. Without the developments in technology that we've had, we would never be able to achieve that level of immersion. One of my current favorite franchises right now, and I consider myself a Lord Journeyman, because I'm not quite at War Master just yet, is the world of Destiny, and this happens to be from Destiny 2. And since more resources are being put into games, additional aspects of the games are also being fleshed out, in particular, the lore. Just in this picture alone, I could probably talk for a full hour of all the lore that is implicit in here. The white waterfall that you see is actually called Radioloria, which is the Vex mind fluid. And the Vex are a robotic time-traveling race who they terraform or machine-form entire planets to create simulations in which they are the only ones who succeed. In the background on that uh, cylindrical tower, there is a dropship from the Cabal. The Cabal are a race of warring beasts, basically, that roll over other civilizations into their own. And that's just a few seconds worth of lore. There are entire YouTube channels dedicated to discussing the lore of this game. Back to Assassin's Creed. This one is Assassin's Creed Origins. And the reason why I bring this game up twice, first, of course, for the impact that it made back in 2008, but more recently for this one, the developers at Ubisoft realized how detailed that their research was and how much people used their game to explore history and learn about history, that they actually created a discovery mode where you can walk around ancient Egypt during Greek occupation through guided tours. You can walk through Alexandria, go through different waypoints, and a narrator will discuss what you're viewing at that time, its, his, excuse me, its historical significance. And again, all of this is possible with the advancements of technology. So as I said, I've had a few podcast guests um, who do quite a bit of art, and the ones that I've actually had on the show are denoted with an asterisk. So first up, we'll talk about Ash Lyons. Ash is a senior visual effects artist at Gearbox Studios down in Texas. As per his Twitter bio, he's the occasional giver of bad advice. He is a dad and he is a gamer. One of the games that Ash worked on was Battle War, in particular, Beatrix. Now, as a visual effects artist, he doesn't necessarily do the character or level design. He does all the additional nuances that bring characters to life. In particular, that large syringe behind Beatrix is actually part of her right arm. And Ash's job was to have that liquid change color based on the type of ability that the character or the player was activating. Additionally, it was his responsibility to work out, we'll just call it the physics matrix of the fluid so that it would have the guide points for how to slosh around realistically as Beatrix moved her arm. One of the other things that Ash has worked on, this is from the trailer for Borderlands 3 due out in September. And his, that's right. <laughs> and his responsibility was creating the hologram effects from the hologram that is being summoned behind Zane. So he's not involved necessarily in the design of the environments or the characters themselves, he does the other subtleties that give life to the game and the experience. Brandon McKamey, goes by the name Gamma Trap, is a digital artist. He works very closely with Mylan Games, a lore master in the Destiny community, creating pieces of art for Mylan to use in his videos. He also does online tutorials, and is generally a pretty good guy. As I was talking to him, if I could use his artwork in my presentation, he's a pretty solid dude. So here's an example of one of his tutorial videos. And this video in particular was adding lighting effects to your art. And this is from Destiny, so that is what is called a Shadow of Yore, holding the revolver known as Thorn. And through this video, he goes into detail of how the lighting effects and shading works within Photoshop. And he does a few little art pieces right on screen, says use this brush, use this setting, and he goes through it all. And here's a nice high resolution image of that. And I gotta say, that looks absolutely fantastic. Okay, here's Tommy Tallarico. 
This man holds five world records and includes things like most commercially developed games and largest audience for a live symphony, symphony of over 752,000 people. Not only has this guy created such an amazing experience, he's also founded what's called GANG, the Game Audio Network Guild. And in this, aspiring musicians are able to link up and network with each other, as well as other game developers, to have their art put into music, or excuse me, put into games. And also, him and I must be of like minds, because he is also a TED speaker of the speech called Video Games of Art in Disguise. Stephanie Ray is a cosplayer in Michigan. She goes by the name of Zophiel Ray. And she's a th excuse me, 3D printing enthusiast. She actually taught herself 3D printing to the point where she 3D prints parts to fix her 3D printer and to make more advanced 3D prints. And if you go on my website, the episode is called Self-Replicating Cosplay. It's, it was a blast to record. So here's a few of the things that Zophiel has created. All the way on the left, we have a laser rifle from the Fallout series. In the middle, that is her award-winning cosplay of Josephine de Montelier of the Dragon Age franchise. And finally, we have a necromancer elf that she brings to various Renaissance fairs. And of course, all of these costumes are handmade and self-produced. And I think cosplay is one of the things that really encapture the inspiration of geek culture. Because it brings together so many different things. It brings together the art, the visual art, the painting, the manufacturing, the seizures, like the costume design, the prop design and manufacturing. All of things all come together in this just selfless expression of fandom and joy. And when you come to events like this, you get to meet up with other like-minded people and truly enjoy each other's fandoms. And quick side note, that gentleman all around the left-hand side, he's actually here tonight, the man who is dressed as Ant-Man. That is Forceworks 1 costuming, Ray Umberley. He is upstairs doing a Fallout cosplay and a full Fallout pharmacy. So make sure you go say hi to him. So now that we have all this stuff, what do we do with it? What do we do with all this information? I would love to see more geek culture being brought into the classroom. Of course, keep teaching the classics because there is nothing like a master of their work being recited or performed by a master of the arts. There's just no competition there. I'm just saying, please consider the possibility of allowing more geek art into the classroom. And a part of the reason for this is one of the biggest challenges in school is getting the students engaged. When you're using things like video games or comic books or certain movies, the students already have engagement because they're already enthusiastic about that. Use that enthusiasm because half of the work is already done for you. And additionally, geek culture is providing a new career path that really wasn't available 10, 20 years ago. I was at Hudson Valley GamerCon here two weeks ago, and I was able to sit in on a panel discussion where department heads of various gaming studios in the Capital Region were talking about the state of esports, uh, specifically here in the Capital Region, and just the state of video games. And I was able to ask the question, how do you see gaming as a driving force in the arts? And Steve Derrick of Vicarious Visions suddenly perked up. He said, ooh. And I said, oh. <laughs> Turns out, he's got a background in fine arts. And through him and the other executives that were on this panel, turns out gaming studios employ more artists than engineers. Because you don't have just the visual arts, you have the environmental design, you have the prop design, you have the character design, you have the texture design. All these things are done by artists. So through gaming and other aspects of geek culture, we can start to limit that old cliche of the starving artist. We have a legitimate career path here. You're getting paid. You got health insurance. It's a big thing. <laughs> so art begets creativity. Creativity begets innovation. Innovation begets progress. 
When we allow the arts to flourish, society gains what it needs to progress. Thank you so much for coming to my panel. So like I said, we're gonna do a general Q&A, and I already see some of his hand up. You wanna come on down? This microphone should be live. So just speak right into that, and let's see what we got. So I'm just curious, have you heard of a game called Anthem? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you said a lot about uh, video game developers' rights. I'm just curious what are your thoughts and opinions on the whole crisis of 50 hour work week, crunch time causing anxiety and depression. And, like there are stories of developers just uh, locking themselves in rooms and crying. Uh, so thank you for your question. So my thoughts on like the working conditions of game developers? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a sad fact. And I know a few game developers through my online interactions, and I know a few other visual effects artists uh, that work on some Netflix series and such. And one of the big issues that uh, they have is they don't have full-blown representation like many other occupations do. So they do a lot of contract work. So this is getting into like the business inner workings of things. And I, it's rough. I work at a job where if certain things need to get done by a specific day, you're, you're going to be there. Fortunately for me, I'm still paid by the hour, so I get overtime. But that's not the way it is for everyone. And some positions, especially if they're salary, you've got to work until the job is done. And in gaming, unfortunately, it, that practice seems to be a little too rampant for my personal liking. Uh, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed, and it dips definitely into more of the business decisions that are being made between all that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the con. We got another two days of this. Take care, guys.